everybody. Welcome to the Author's Forge, where every good conversation starts. We are excited. We have... Hey, here we are. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Author's Porch, where every good conversation starts. Tonight, we are super excited. We have Joyce Reynolds Ward on the porch with us. How are you doing, Joyce? Oh, it's warm here. I just had a little visit with my horse and made sure she wasn't colicking. <laughs> oh, bless. You know, when I was small, we had a horse and um, the horse didn't like me. I was a redheaded girl and I, I thought that it was because of my red hair that the horse didn't like me. <laughs> but I've always had a love. They're absolutely beautiful creatures. And I read in your bio that it's been something that you've enjoyed the love of horses since the age of nine. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Um, actually, it's kind of funny. I saw a picture on Facebook today where someone took a picture of a horse trailer with it all started with a $75 pony. In my case, it was a $25 pony, but that was in the 60s. <laughs> oh, bless. So, guys, I've had just a little bit of time to get to know Joyce through not only her bio, but the small conversations that we had before we went live. Also, I'm reading one of her books, which I'm falling in love with. And I had to fangirl just a little bit before we went live as well and tell her how much I loved it and how I'm secretly falling in love. Well, not secretly anymore because I'm totally letting everybody know. But I'm falling in love with one of the characters in her book, which is actually the main character in her book. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of intro and then we are going to delve deep into the mind of Joyce Reynolds Ward so that we can learn more about her, her lovely books, and her process to authoring. So uh, Joyce Reynolds Ward is a speculative fiction writer. Her short stories have appeared in Black Eyed Peas on New Year's Day, Children of a Different Sky, River, How Beers Save the World 1 and 2, Fantasy Scroll Magazine, and Trust and Treachery, among others. She has numerous books out, one of which I have been reading, The Martinier Legacy. And correct me if I, did I say that right, Joyce? Martinier. Martinier. I'm sorry? Martinier. Martinier. Okay, good. Now I can say it right when I'm reading. Martinier Legacy, which is a trilogy. And I'm telling you folks, I am loving it so far. Joyce also edits anthologies and has earned a semi-finalist and honorable mention placement in the writer in Writers of the Future. Joyce has a passion for reading independent Northwest Writers Association. So Joyce, thank you for being here tonight and for your passion of writing and reading and all things literacy literacy because it's it's not often that you find somebody who's on every end of the spectrum when it comes to the literary world but you are and i honor you for that well thank you every every end of this well oh you mean the short fiction as well as the long fiction Yes, that and also the reading, the writing, editing anthologies, sitting on boards, just really delving into it. Most people, they just write a book. They barely even read or some people, they just read and they don't write or I mean, you know, you're just getting into all aspects of it and not just helping yourself, but helping others by editing and being on that writer's association as well helps other authors learn. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Well, and then another factor, too, is that when I was teaching middle, middle school special ed, my specialty was um, remedial writing. Okay. And so I was working with middle schoolers, you know, primarily the boys who look at you and you got, they go, two page paper, one page paper. <laughs> and it would be, okay, sit here tell me and so they would dictate to me and i would ask questions and i would over the process I am, and over the process of three years of working with some of these kids i could get them to do a little bit of writing yeah and that's that's awesome um you mentioned that you were 
a teacher, a special education teacher, and that you help them kind of get their their words out on paper and in writing. And I know another author who is a teacher and she's doing the same thing. And I commend you all for that because that's not part of what, I mean, they have to write papers or they have to write assignments, but actually writing from a place of imagination or writing um, parts of their story or really getting into the literary part of it is not part of a teacher's job, but you guys took that extra step. Well, and the, the fun thing, though, is that when I was teaching, um, I actually did get a bit of inspiration from the kids, not directly onto the paper. But there were times like when I'd be working with a story where I just kind of sit down and, you know, be us with the kids. There was one story that I did for a anthology for the late Jay Lake when he first was diagnosed with colon cancer, Jay Lake and the Ski Bum Zombies. You can find that up on my Curious Fictions <laughs> for free. Yeah, But um, where I just sat down with the kids and said, okay, what do you think? Um, because they were all wannabe ski bums, wannabe ski patrollers, wannabe ski movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah Wicks. The boy, did they ever give me ideas. <laughs> that is so cool. So what made you want to write your first book? What was the inspiration? Oh, you really want to go back that far? <laughs> well, I've been writing since I, you know, I mean, I was like somewhere in elementary school when the only thing I can remember was a yellow piece of paper that I rolled into the typewriter and it was about the, a fanfic about Mighty Mouse. That's all I remember about it. Wow. The next one I did was a trilogy about a girl and a horse winning the Kentucky Derby. That's cool. <laughs> the Triple Crown. But, you know, and I've been poking at it off and on ever since. But in the, oh, about 2007, I had been teaching for a couple of years. I'd gotten into a situation where I was cleaning up a mess and doing a lot of technical writing. Special ed doesn't just involve teaching. In my case, I was case managing. And so I was doing a lot of technical writing. Um, IEPs are classic. The individual education programs that you write as a special ed case manager are classic tech writing. And I had to write something like about 40 of them above and beyond my usual caseload that year yeah. and reports for eligibilities. And at one point I remember looking at my computer in my classroom and going, I want to be writing fiction. And so I, the first book out of that batch is NetWalk, which is my NetWalk sequence series. Mm -hmm. Um, which is another near future, a little bit further out than the Martini Air Legacy. And it was about wireless computer implants, but we get corporate soap opera in there. <laughs> that in this case, the family is four generations of, of women who control access to this technology. Ooh. And there's skiing in it, and there's horses in it. And I even throw in an alien invasion. But it was, it was kind of also, besides in exploring control over, in this case, it was the wireless computer implants and uploading digital personalities. It was also just the struggle for power between mothers and daughters over four generations. <clears throat> and there was a little bit of politics in it. And that's kind of where I started out. But at the same time, I mean, I one of my earlier stints, um, I'd been advised by a mentor that I really should be working on short stories. It was still traditional publishing and still, well, you get disability through short stories. Mm -hmm. And then my life blew up because I was raising an autistic son and things got kind of crazy. And 
then, you know, there was a break, but there was net netlock. Then there is the fantasy series, which is non-European high fantasy. Cause it's like, I've been to Europe twice. I've never really been to a castle. The thing, when I, you say castle to me, I think about going to the Southwest and going down to a state park called Hovenweep and seeing a Native American castle. That's what it was labeled as, but it was a stone building uh, contemporaneous with European castles. And so that's kind of what I tend to think of because I've never really been in a castle. Mm. So I wrote what I knew, which was um, Oregon, uh, the Northwest. And that was kind of what, it, and the goddess's honor was kind of about what happens when you have a battle between the gods that all spills over into men you know, or to people. But there was also a little bit of exploration of what happens if an empire tries to invade there mm -hmm. and there's a plague that worldwide plague caused by magic in, that was created back in the empire. And so the empire invasion fails and then they try to come back. But then the uh, colonies end up being stronger than the empire. And the descendant of the, an exiled descendant of the empire rulers comes back and kicks butt and she's an empress. So like, I'm just listening to this and I could listen to this all night long because this is totally the genre that I love to read. This, this is my favorite type of genre. And so where do you get your ideas? Where Do they just come to you? Are you inspired by something in particular in your life um, that brings this out of you? Or do the characters just jump in your head and speak to you? Not like audible, but. <laughs> well, it's, it's, Different things happen with different stories. Um, the Goddesses Honor series was originally actually goes way back to my high, to my junior high and high school years because I read Lord of the Rings and then decided to rewrite it as science fiction and then decided to rewrite it as fantasy and I could never ever ever get into it until I was. <laughs> You know, here it was about 2008, 2009. I was writing short stories about that world because I could just never, I, I got piles of paper where I tried to get into that and I didn't. And so I go, okay, I'm gonna write a story about, short story about this character in this world. Mm -hmm. and I set it off to a market. The editor who had the same name as one of my teaching colleagues, ironically, um, set it back and said, this reads like the first chapter of a novel. And I thought about it and I looked at it and I did the one thing I never ever do. I wrote back to the editor and thanked her for it and mentioned, and, oh yeah, by the way, I don't think you're in the room next to me teaching, but you do have the same name. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, but you know, and I wrote that story and at that point, the story that I had been trying to tell about that world unfolded. Uh, okay. Netwalk started with a uh, horror novel that was totally mainstream and then I parked it and then I started getting some ideas about virtual reality and these characters and that just kind of cooked around for about 10 years before I actually sat down and wrote it. But the most recent one, the Martini Air Legacy series, literally started back in 2019 when my friend Frog Jones said, hey, I'm starting a press, pitch me a story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have been poking at, um, issues involved with agricultural technology because at the time, and it's still an issue now, one of the big issues is the growing computerization of ag tech, including tractors. Well, John Deere 
was locking farmers out so that they could not go in and hack their own software. It was, I mean, it was, you couldn't fix it. You had to wait for an additional, for an official John Deere person to show up. Well, if you're out there plowing a field or you're seeding or you're doing harvest, you don't have time for John Deere IT to show up. You've yeah. got to fix it. So I started poking in that after, you know, what was the idea? Because I went, okay, Frog, so here's the idea. Um, we've got a rancher. She's a woman. She's gone through a nasty divorce. And she's trying to do, she's trying to create a new technology. And she's having problems getting the funding. And she might lose her ranch. And that's how it all started. Oricon 2019. <laughs> and by the time I ended up, I mean, various other pieces. I was, we were driving back and forth between Portland and uh, Enterprise pretty frequently in that time period. Going through the Dells, all of a sudden I'm hearing ads about this game show. And it's a real thing where various small towns and small cities compete against each other for $500,000, and it's a web-based competition. Mm -hmm. It's not a streaming or a TV thing. And, you know, most of this is PR, but it's like, you know, doing publicity work for various small businesses, kicking this in, kicking that in, promoting the city. But the key factor is, is that each town has to solicit a certain number of social media votes. And that's where I got the idea for the Ag Innovator, the uh, um, game show that kicks everything off. And so I've been working with that. And it was still like Ruby was going through a nasty divorce. And Ruby is from Ruby Peak in the Willowas, <laughs> which I look at every day when I got my living room. And th this, Ruby's ex-husband, Gabe, kept saying, no, you don't understand. It didn't happen like that. There was a reason why it all happened the way it did. <laughs> and then COVID happened, because this was going to, the other thing was I, I had gone to a workshop up at Willowa Lake, Fish Trap, which is, Summer Fish Trap is really good, and it's really fun, and it's really pretty. And I workshopped with a New York Times bestselling writer. And he said, you're 95% there. You need to be pitching. So I signed up for World Fantasy Convention. I'm going to go pitch. And this nice. is going to be the book. And then COVID happened. And it was like, oh, heck, I'm just going to keep writing. Three books later. Okay, I'm done. No, wait a minute. At the very end of realization, a character pops up. And that became the heritage of Michael Martinier. Well, okay, it was going to be a novella. <laughs> oh, man. 120,000 words later. <laughs> no way. Way. And then Gabe finally said, okay, I'm going to tell you what happened before the before inheritance, before the whole series. And then it was like, whoa. This is deep. <laughs> about the same time I was reading a history of um, Mar Marguerite of Navarre, who was the daughter of Catherine de' Medici, who was oh. married to, <laughs> you know, the French king and was a kingmaker in her own right, but she was a Medici with ties to the Borgias. And so yes. it's like, Oh, my word, the Martiniers are um, up from a bastard Medici line. <laughs> oh, my God, I did not know that. But now, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm so into this now. Like, I want to table every single book that I'm reading now. You just, <laughs> like, brought me into this. I've got, like, tears coming down. I'm so excited. So, you know... I love how you were talking about how your characters basically were, you were going one way and your characters were like, hey, hey, 
patting you on the shoulder going, hey, hey, listen to me. This is where I'm taking you. This is where I need you to go right now. That is so interesting. And you took different parts of life that you the, were watching happening and they were kind of melding together into the storyline. And then it just started happening from there. Yeah, it's, and the, I default sometimes to this corporate soap opera because back in the day, I loved Dallas. <laughs> It was are you and all yes. this. But the other thing is that I was a corporate wife for a number of years and I saw some of the stuff. And it was a publicly held company, which is totally different. But I was also a corporate wife back in the era when they were having all of those takeovers in the 80s and 90s and the hostile takeovers and reading about that stuff. Yeah. and reading about the scheming. But I was also at one point in the 80s, I spent some time as a corporate securities litigation or a complex of securities litigation paralegal, which means you really get into the weeds with um, finances and prospectuses and just you see the dark underbelly when you do complex securities litigation. And yeah, so, sounds it was, like it. oh yeah, well, I worked the, I worked on one of the biggest cases at the time, which was the Washington public power supply bond uh, default, because back in the eighties, they were trying to build five nuclear plants at once. They got two built mm -hmm. and the other three, they couldn't finance. And there were things happening that we never, there was never anything solid on it. But one of the, one of the stories that I can tell from that era was that at one point, apparently the principals were running around Spokane try, trying to meet a guy in a parking lot who was apparently going to give them a briefcase full of money so that they could pay the bondholders. No. That's how weird it got. That's wild. Oh, yeah. There was just, it was wild and crazy and weird. And <laughs> the other cases I worked on were equally twisted and wild and weird. Yeah. Uh, uh, There's all kinds of stories in those, all kinds of spinoff type of fantasy stories that could come off of that that without divulging the insider stories that's what i love about real life real life could be turned into fiction really fast <laughs> oh yeah and you know there's a lot there's a lot of material there was just just the interactions and what people do and say to each other in those circumstances and you do realize that there are people who are absolutely totally sociopathic and you know, yes, and very good at making money. Yes, and some people, some of the things that happen is almost unrealistic. It's like, oh my god, this sounds like a book, but it's real life. And then that—that that is definitely a story. Um, so, are you traditionally published or self-published? I know you said you said your friend uh, created a press. But are all your books um, traditionally published or self-published? Self-published. I had a couple that I had sold to a, a micro press, but it went under. Mm -hmm. And I got the rights back because, um, well, one book they wanted to hang on to. The other one, which was the first of Goddess's Honor, they changed their focus to be a um, more evangel to be an evangelical Christian press. And I said, excuse me, I have a couple of uh, secondary characters who are gay. I don't think you're going to like that. <laughs> and they said, no, we don't like that. Here's your rights back. The Maybe. other one, uh, the other one was actually harder to do. And I had to, because they'd gone through the work and they were, had put it up. And I think it was one of their money makers, but, um, my most of my short fiction tends to be traditionally published. Um, I'm not currently submitting except to specific anthology calls right now because last summer I pulled up my submission records because I went, you know, I haven't checked on this for a while. 
Okay, I've got eight stories out. Four have rejections, good rejections, the usual ones, which is we like your work, but we can't use it. <laughs> yeah. But then there were two that fell through the cracks and then two where the venues died in between the time I submitted them and the time I checked. And then wow. so at that point I said, you know, I think I want to put my energy into putting out some books and I'm just going to, because the short story market has been contracting quite a bit and there are a lot of people trying to break in. But most of my, yeah, most of my short stories have been traditionally published and the one ones that I think there's only one or two, if you look at my Amazon central page that are originals, the rest are reprints. Okay, and do you prefer traditional or self-publishing? For books, I really, I'm really leaning more, more towards self-publishing. I have a number of traditionally published, mid, what you call mid-list friends, and just seeing what they have had to go through. Um, my current mentor has gone through five pseudonyms. They love her work. Her publisher loves what she does, but they don't get the numbers back fast enough to convince the sales committee. Yeah. And then 10 years ago, is it that long ago? Maybe not quite that long ago. Um, nine years ago, I was at a convention where a big name author was the guest of honor and big name author's editor was there. She sat down and started talking about what they were looking for in a panel. And I went with my traditionally published and self-published friends. Traditionally published friends were mid-list. We sat there and listened. We walked out. We looked at each other and said, they don't want us. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of when I said, you know, I'm not going to keep trying to beat my head against the wall. I kept getting these rejections that said, we love your work. We love your voice. Can't sell it. So from the tone of the rejection, it was pretty clearly the sales committee didn't think it was viable. Yeah, I you know there there's definitely a space for traditional publishing, and I, and I get that, but it's a very very small group. And the problem with the traditional publishing is the small group is great, but writers are like this, the authors are like this, and people are trying to get their works of art seen. And people nowadays, like myself, are feverishly reading. I mean, I can read one book in a week. That can be a 400-page book in a week. And if I only had traditional published authors to read, I would never have anything to read. So I predominantly read self-published authors because I'm discovering so much more books to read, so many more books to read now. And so, I mean... I look at the traditional and they're great because I do read traditional authors. Nora Roberts is my favorite. I will read anything she puts out. She puts something out and I'm reading it like that. But the with the self-published authors, I can hear a different voice that you won't hear in the traditional publishing world. So I think that there's definitely this, this massive space for people who were never able to be heard before who are finally able to break out and finally be heard. Right. I, I think it's like that in every world, right. We're in the culture of, of writing and, and authoring. Um, and there's other cultures that were squelched with their voice for so long. So um, yeah, I love that, you know, you, you've worked both, both avenues and you've been both traditionally and um, self-publishing. So you understand both worlds. Whereas myself, I've never even tried traditionally because it never enticed me. And in the beginning, um, it was always that fear of, was I ever good enough? So I was just, at the beginning, I was like, oh, I'm not there yet, so I'm not even going to try. But now that I know more about both worlds, I know that I want to do self. I don't want nothing to do with the other one because I like having the control over everything. I like being my own person and standing on it. So for me, it's uh, I stay in the self-publishing world. The other thing is I tend to write a lot of really oddly crossed genres. I mean, I'm calling the Martini Air legacy, especially Broken Angel, 
science fiction western mm -hmm. but it's more than that and i can just see a sales committee going what do we call this <laughs> what is this <laughs> you know and then yeah. and self-publishing allows for a lot more that plus certain categories romance is pretty much except for the top names romance is pretty much self-publishing and part of that is the romance readers are so voracious there's like reverse harem romances are exclusively self-published there's other little subgenres like that where um i'm hearing now that paranormal romance is pretty much self-publishing yeah. so you know, unless you're patty briggs who my uh, it, one of, it's kind of funny because one of my high school friends is Patty Briggs' assistant. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and there, if you look at what she did, she grabbed on to the Tri Cities of Washington and brought that into a fantasy world that incorporates werewolves and vampires and Native American, but also traditional mythologies where it just all mixes together wildly. And here it is in central Washington. Yeah. So, yeah, it's there, you know, so there, there's a lot, there's a lot, but, you know, and for somebody who's breaking into that particular genre, self-publishing is pretty much the way to go unless you can, unless you're doing young adult is what I am hearing. And, you know, this is just from, following writing community on Twitter, following various communities on Facebook and yeah. just keeping my, keeping my finger to, or keeping my ear on what's happening. And, and you, you have to, if you are self publishing, you have to keep your ear uh, to the ground at all times because there's a lot of ebbs and flows within the writing world. And you have to understand where something is going you have to understand where the marketing is changing too, so that you can market your books as well. And social media is huge. Um, so if you're not if you're not paying attention to the self publishing world, you're not going to sell your books. Well, and even in publishing, even in traditional publishing, um, my current mentor is very very savvy in that respect. She's one of the founding members of the Book View Cafe which is a publishing cooperative founded by a, a number of uh, mid-list authors who were trying to promote work and get their work out. And, you know, I've learned, she and I talk very frequently as well as our other friends about what is involved in keeping track of publishing and, this is the same friend who has multiple pseudonyms because she outrights the sales committee. <laughs> That's what you got to do sometimes. <laughs> even, you know, the thing is, is that um, even in traditional publishing, so much of the marketing is starting to fall on the shoulders of the author. And I've had several friends um, who had their, um, you know, they had a series going. And they got the plug pulled because the numbers weren't right. Mm. And I think the most tragic example is that of John Pitts, J.A. Pitts, who had forged and fired paranormal romance series featuring a lesbian um, blacksmith lead character. And I think two or three books in, they, his publisher pulled the plug because the numbers weren't there. And he fortunately, before he died, he got picked up by a small Seattle area press to do the rest of the publishing. But that, you know, that's one example. Another one is uh, Mike Shepard Moscow, who wrote, uh, is writing a very popular space opera, the Chris Longknife Space Operas. And the problem, you know, they they pulled the plug plug on Mike. Well, Mike puts out a Chris Longknife book, 
and it gets snapped up, but it wasn't mm -hmm. big enough. And so he, he started doing the whole self-publishing thing. But even before that, he was a very aggressive self-promoter. And so, it, but the, the nature of it has changed and just trying to stay on top of it is wow. crazy. That, that's the hardest part. I, I think the hardest part is the marketing um, when it comes to publishing. So if you had any advice that you would give to another author or somebody that was just wanting to start out, like they have a story, they know they, this, they want this as their their career or their their passion in life, what would your advice be to a fellow author just starting out? Um, first of all, follow writers like Jean Friedman. Jean's readily available. She runs classes at a, online classes right now at a very decent price. Find some others of that ilk. I mean, Jean has Writer's Digest, especially if you're a beginner, you want to look at Writer's Digest. Um, <clears throat> in genre, once we get up and rolling, some conventions still have writing workshops and convention writing workshops are a good start. Um, eventually work your way up to the higher level workshops like Tao's Toolbox or things like, or um, Viable Paradise or Roll the Dice and Go for Clarion. But that's part of it is do your reading, do your research, but don't just stay with Writer's Digest. Look at magazines like Poets and Writers, which is very heavily literary, but you can learn from the literary world. You know, I mean, literary. Um, follow sites like Literary Hub. Go to your local independent bookstore. Look at the, what's on the shelf talk to the bookstore seller, talk to the bookstore owner. I, one of my, I, I, here in Enterprise, I go down to the book loft in Enterprise, Oregon. The ownership has changed hands, but I will go and I will talk with the, with the bookstore owner and just kind of like, hey, what's going on? This is what I'm seeing. Um, find, like for science fiction and fantasy, follow, um, news sources like Mike Blyer's File 770. If you're a writer, you need to be following that. And just, but there are comparable resources for mystery. And mystery, if you could, if you're a woman, Sisters in Crime, Mystery Writers of America, um, Western Writers, Western Writers of America. The romance world is kind of, romance writers in America are blowing up right now. And, yes. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, but find, you know, that's the thing. Find the organizations. Um, find where people, where writers are hanging out and talking. Ask questions. Listen. Um, if you click with somebody and take see if they'll let you be a mentor or see if they will be your mentor and just because that's a lot of what i did is just panels and listening to people and talking to people um the late jay lake was one of my mentors as well and so you just and read um ursula Le Guin's references are good Jeff Vandermeer's Wonder Book is a good source. Um, for me, actually, when I started out, um, John Steinbeck has two diaries that were written when he was composing his two greatest books. Um, Journal of a Novel for East of Eden. And it, he does, because that was how he warmed up, is he would write. A journal entry and some of it was about personal life and a bunch of it was about the book thinking about the book he also had one for the grapes of wrath called working days and both of them talk extensively about the process when i was working on the trilogy martini or legacy core trilogy i was reading um steinbeck's working days and realizing that the whole trilogy and my writing piece 
was matching John Steinbeck's, which I had never realized before. Wow. I'm going, oh, wow, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That that's great advice. I was sitting here. I don't know if you realized I was taking notes. I don't know if you see my notes, but I was taking notes. I mean, I could play back the video and everything, which I always play back the video. But of course, I'm taking notes at the same time because that's what I do. I listen when when authors are giving advice. I listen because myself, I'm I I call myself a lifelong learner. Right. And I believe the only way that you are going to become better at your craft no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing is, and I love that you said this, listen. Yes. Listen, take advice if it's going to be given because there is no bad advice out there mm -hmm. because if they give it to you and it doesn't work for you, that's okay, but you are learning something from it. So I, I love your advice and I've got some books here that I need to read. Thank you so much. <laughs> So through your career, I know there's been people that have supported you, that have stood by you. You have mentioned some of your mentors here. But if you could, you know, just mention anybody in particular um, or that has given you that support and stood by you and really said, you know what, Joyce, you, I'm going to be here no matter what. I'm going to stand by you and I'm going to push your career forward. Who would that be for you? Um, writing world, I would say Phyllis Irene Radford. And she, you know, Irene Radford, uh, various other pen names. Early on, uh, back in the 90s, when I was right, getting really started, that would be K.W. Jeter of, you know, famous, notorious for steampunk. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jay Lake, of course. And um, my husband is been financially and supportive and he's now that he's retired he cooks for me <laughs> <laughs> that, my husband cooks for me too we we never leave our office we're like no this character won't leave me alone until i finish this line so, so yeah it's great that they cook for us that is very, very yes. important oh that that's a great um tribe that you have because without that tribe all those books that you've written and that wonderful story that is just stuck in my head that I have on my Kindle. My Kindle's in the living room right now, but I would I would show you my Kindle with it on it right now. Uh, I have a Kindle app on my phone too, and then I have the read right here on my um, thing. But yeah, I read everywhere I go. I have it on my phone. I have it uh, on my, uh, what's it called? The tab on my computer. My brain is starting to shut down. It's getting late at night. <laughs> and then I have my Kindle. So I take my book everywhere I go. So if it wasn't for that tribe, then you, who knows if you would be able to write these wonderful stories. And that's the, that's what I keep telling everybody. You have to find a tribe, that tribe of people that are willing to support you, help you grow, help you learn, sometimes wrangle you in and go, Hey, wake up. You are good enough. You can do this. <laughs> I mean, another person to mention is Alma Alexander who has written some beautiful, marvelous Secrets of Jinshe, Embers of Heaven, the sequel to, to the Secrets of Jinshe. Um, and I just actually, I did the layout because I acquired vellum, but she put out through uh, Book View Cafe, the, a, a I mean, if you're into fairy tales, you have to get her fractured fairy tales. They're all original and they are just amazing. You know, this isn't the first time I've heard something about fractured fairy tales. So that's very interesting. Yes. No, Alma is, Alma is writing, well, her late husband, Deck, and I mean, Deck and Alma. Back in the days of Usenet, in the in the nineties, they met on the Usenet writing group called Misc Dot Writing, and then they were. I remember seeing the relationship happen. She <laughs> dropped everything, left. Was she in South Africa or Australia? At the, I think Australia. She re dropped everything and went to Florida to meet Deck. They fell in love. They married. Deck was newspaper writer, 
a newspaper editor and a writer himself. And like she said, when he recently passed away, um, especially the stories in this fractured fairy tale book, she would hand them to Deck because he was his, her first reader and he would read it and then he would go back to her and say, I hate you. You're so good a writer. I hate you. Oh. <laughs> but I then love that. Because, I you know, love that. Oh my you know, goodness. You know, and so, and, and very poetic writer. I can't approach that. I, for her anthologies, the two short stories I have in River and Children of a Different Sky um, are probably my closest that I'll ever come to writing like Alma. And they're both kind of magic realism, fantasy, kind of almost fairy tale in their own style. Man, I'm going to have to, you know, this is like the third or fourth time I've, so I've heard somebody mention in some type of conversation about fractured fairy tales. So this is the universe telling me that I need to read this. So I, that this is happening, like it's happening. So let me ask you before we end the show and go off into our different houses, <laughs> um, how do, can you let everybody know how to reach you, how to get uh, your wonderful pieces of um, literature there that you've written? Right now, um, everything is up on Amazon, on Kindle. Um, I have an Amazon central page that has everything, including anthologies and some of the short stories. Um, I have some things up for free on Curious Fictions under Joyce Reynolds Ward. Um, those are also free, and there's a couple of Martini Air Legacy pieces there, outtakes, short stories. Yeah, you might like the one called That Martini Air Look, because that's a Gabe story. And then, well, an then interview with the Martini Air. Um, then there's... Um, but I'm also available on Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Apple, and a number of other smaller um, distributors through Draft to Digital. If you go on Books to Read, you'll find them everywhere. You know? So that's where I'm primarily at. Um, I'm kind of some of my thing books are available as paperback. That's a little more expensive for me to set up. I'm getting ready to set up Broken Angel and Paperback, and I'm going to also set it set up the Heritage of my, Michael Martini. Or eventually, all of the uh, Martini or Legacy books will be available through Ingram Spark. Um, right now, the at least two of the three of the trilogy are available. I, my book in bookstore person tells me she can't order realization, which I don't know why, but <laughs> and I guess uh, I think Barnes and Noble also has some of my books available through expanded distribution and paperback. Okay, awesome. And we have all of your links that you um, sent us before the interview and the show notes as well. So everybody can go on the show notes and just click right on the link and it'll take you right to the books. So it's super easy for anyone to go and grab a book. If you guys want to read along to the Martinier um, books, The Broken Angel, and talk to me about it, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about this book because trust me, you're going to love Gabe as much as I do. <laughs> and you're going to love just the premise of the story. So Joyce, before we end the show, do you have any parting words for the viewers and, and for anyone out there that is just, you know, loving what you do? Because I know I am. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, there are possibly... I'm working on a sixth book in the Martini or Legacy called Justine Fixes Everything, Reflection <laughs> of Mortality. And it it goes back and forth because Justine is telling the stories that happened to her. But there's also in the interlude, you know, there's a chapter about the past, and then there's a chapter about Justine's present in 2086. And there's scheming and things happening in both of them. And then there will, I kind of, there's one last Gabe book, which is Gabe and Ruby. 
um, after the conclusion of the trilogy um, called Repairing the Legacy, which is Gabe just trying to fix everything. Mm. And then there will be a collection of short stories about, and I don't know, about Gabe's time with in his, his brother-in-law's uh, mercenary company called Alvarez Armory. And I wrote a very dark little story that is kind of going to be toward the end of it called Red Running. We went driving up the Amnaha River and I kept listening to Neil Young's Powder Finger, which is, if you're at all familiar with that song, it is a very dark song. Mm -hmm. And the story is a, one of the darkest ones I've ever written. And the thing was, is that now it's kicked off things that um, gets, re there is a reference to it in Broken Angel because I was still finishing that off. But there are a lot of references to what was going on in that in Justine Fixes Everything. Wow. And yeah, there's, it's just all intertwined. I love that. So I'm not a person who likes one. I mean, I like one-off books. Don't get me wrong. They're great. But when you have a whole world built around and there's multiple books, I like start salivating over those. So I'm hooked. I'm going to continue reading. I'm so excited that you came on tonight because I have enjoyed this conversation thoroughly. And you have so many great works of art and so much knowledge in the literary world. I think that our viewers are going to really learn a lot by watching this video and the advice that you were able to give them as well as learn about the books that you have written and follow your works as well. I wanna thank you so much for sharing your light and sharing your work with us tonight because it's, it's not easy for a lot of people to put themselves out there and you're not afraid to do that. And I love that fierceness because when you have a passion to write and it comes across in your interviews, it comes across when you just are able to just freely talk about it. And I've enjoyed this conversation. So thank you so much for talking to me about your book tonight and let me fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so much i'm just trying to pay it forward awesome guys thank, thank you so much i hope that you enjoyed the meet the author with joyce reynolds ward tonight and don't forget to join us back here on thursday for the bombshell book review it is the first um, it's the first episode in our June book, so don't forget to come back. It's 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, 6 p.m. Pacific Time. We'll be back next Tuesday with a new author for you to meet and learn about their books. And if you guys want to go and catch some of Joyce's books or you want to reach out to Joyce and learn anything, all of her links are in the show notes. But that is it for us tonight. I can sit in here and talk to Joyce for hours, but it's late at night. I'm sure she's tired of talking because I'm a talker and I'm going to let her go for now. So guys, we are going to say goodbye to you. Have a good night, Joyce. I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. Oh, I can't quite get the I can't quite get the rodeo queen. Bye-bye <laughs> <laughs> guys. Bye. Bye.